But what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about my experience looking at different types of radical groups and movements for my last book, uh, Radicals, and how they use the internet, but also touch a little bit on the darkness and where I think some of the trends in encryption are going and how the two of those things relate to each other. So this is what I think is, is, is coming. Because uh, I'm, I'm trying to look five or ten years down the line with my work. And what I think is coming, like everyone's at the moment nervous and worried about the radical right and the last 18 months of great political turbulence. But I think it is just the start of a much wider and much longer period of great political change. It's exciting in some respects. It's terrifying in others. I look at the challenges facing society in the next 10 years, the twin forces of artificial intelligence and automation, climate change, aging population, the difficulty of controlling borders. And I just think, oh my goodness, the, the current centre-left, centre-right consensus in politics, even though it's stretching a little bit at the moment, is completely unsustainable. We are like at the beginning of the combination of both the Industrial Revolution and the invention of the printing press happening at the same time. And so we are about to see, I think, some great sort of explosion of all sorts of different types of political radicalism. Now, this is extraordinarily important because political radicalism, fringe movements, outsiders, have always been the motor of change in liberal democracies. It's always outsiders that come up with the ideas that keep society ticking along. So it's extremely important that we encourage radical movements to exist. The problem is that in the next 10 years or so, the governments of the world are not going to want to do that. We are almost certainly going to see, I think, a great increase in various types of online and offline censorship. And I think some of that is already happening, and a lot of it is a great sign of weakness. So, for example, was it a few weeks back that um, Amber Rudd, who, by the way, read Radicals and tweeted that it was a really good book. So I don't know whether that's... <laughs> I've put that on the cover of the paperback, because I'm not sure whether she's going to be happy about that. But um, where she said that we're going to increase the, uh, the total maximum possible sentence for viewing online material to 15 years. 15 years for viewing terrorist material online. Why? I think it's because they understand that they cannot stop it. They cannot actually prevent people from looking at this material. It's getting far more difficult to censor and control. And so what do we do? We put incredibly tough sentencing in place to try and scare people off. And we are going to see more and more of that happening. And this is really bad. And it's really bad because I think it, it's going to constantly narrow the range of ideas that people feel comfortable talking about. And that worries me greatly for the reasons I said earlier. We are entering into a phase of great radicalism, and we need it because we need new ideas. And I want to give you a couple of examples. So for this new book, uh, Radicals, I spent some time in Liberland. Any of you like hardcore libertarians in the room here? Not many. God, what's happened to Open Rights Crew? Where's all the libertarians gone? <sighs> dear, oh dear. Um, <laughs> So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a libertarian, it's, a, it's an idea of creating a new country on the Croatian-Serbian border based on libertarian principles of voluntary taxation, night watchman state. Actually, it's a narco-capitalist, so not even a night watchman state. Like the smallest, weakest type of government imaginable, uh, all using all sorts of different cryptocurrencies with the idea that there is no truly libertarian country in the world and Liberland is going to be it. And in 2015, a Czech... Um, political activist called Vit Jedlička travelled from Prague, drove into Liberland, which is basically a seven square kilometre patch of land that is disputed territory between Croatia and Serbia. And by the way, it's, dis it's like disputed territory is not unusual in international affairs, except in this case, it is very weird because Croatia says this land belongs to Serbia and Serbia <laughs> says this land belongs to Croatia, <laughs> which is like... Never happened in the history of international relations. Um, so Vidjed Lichka sees this and says, well, this, under international law, this is terra nullius. This is land that is not claimed by a sovereign nation state. 
And according to international law, if I turn up there and plant a flag in the ground, I get to claim sovereignty over it, which is what he does. Amazing. And 200,000 people sign up online. He sends official-looking letters to every single head of state in the world saying, welcome to Liberland, the first truly libertarian country in the world. And Croatia immediately shuts all the road border, the road routes into Liberland, and no one can get in there. And every time you try to set foot on Liberland, you get arrested by the Croatian police, who then release you, because what are they arresting you for? They, don't, they claim it's not even their land. So into this ridiculous situation for my book, Radicals, on the one-year anniversary of the founding of Liberland, if I, if I like walk too close to this without realising, can someone shout? <laughs> On the one year anniversary of the founding of Liberland, me and about 100 other of the world's leading libertarians go to just outside uh, Liberland to talk about how this new nation, which is getting thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of donations from libertarians all around the world, especially Bitcoin millionaires, how we can create this brand new exciting place. But here's the thing, right? So I turn up at the airport, land in Croatia, and everyone is sailing through, everyone is sailing through the border. And then they stop me and say, you, this way. And they look up the queue and they take like three others, you, you and you, you come in with us. And I'm like, what, I mean, I have a, I just, I have a UK passport. Everyone else with a UK passport is just going straight through. And they gather like the four or five of us and say, are you all going to Liberland? Well, I mean, I say, oh no, I'm just, I'm just, we're just going to a conference. That's all about Liberland. And they said, don't go to Liberland. If you go to Liberland, you're going to get arrested. And I'm like, holy shit, we're totally being monitored here really, really badly. And then I go to the hotel, give my passport details, like most hotels ask for. And we, we spend a bit of time at the conference. And then I go back in the evening, and the police has turned up during the day and taken all of our passport records. And suddenly I'm thinking, holy shit, I'm pretty scared. I don't trust the Croatian police at all. And I'm suddenly really worried that everything that I write, everything I record, every phone call I make is being monitored by the Croatian police. Now, most of my work up until that point about the dark net had been about the use of some of the sort of encryption technologies by the bad guys you know, about legal pornographers and drug dealers and all the rest of it. But suddenly I'm thinking, I really need to get some really good encryption on my computer here. And, and Vit, who's meant to be at the conference with us as the president of Liberland, is blocked from entering into Croatia three times by the Croatian border police. So me and him have to conduct our interviews via, the phone, via phone or messages. And so obviously I'm like, right, what is the best and most powerful encryption messaging app that I, can, that I can use? And thank the maker that these things exist. The ones that a year ago I'd been saying, oh, Islamic State's using a signal and this is, we've got to... And now I'm like, thank God for signal. Vit, I can talk to you. And I suddenly have a kind of weird moment where I understand the value in a slightly different way. I mean, I understood, obviously, when I gave talks about the dark now, I would always at the end say, and of course they are used by uh, political activists and journalists, and, but I hadn't actually really done it myself, you know. And so to then be in that position, I had a totally different take on it because it wasn't just that I could communicate with Vit about his political activism, it was that I felt freer to express my ideas and even the possibility that the Croatian police were monitoring us was really limiting our ability to think for ourselves and talk and, and come up with ideas. So even the existence of powerful encryption made me feel like I could express myself and Vit could express himself in this situation far more safely than we could have done otherwise. And, 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 and this is why I think it's so important. This is why I've sort of changed my view on it slightly over the last couple of years, as I see all these problems bubbling up in society and I see the value of radical thinking, and I don't agree with a lot of what Vit is saying, I suddenly see how the existence of these tools are incredibly important for where we are heading. Now, the second thing I want to say, and I won't talk for too long because I'd like to hear some questions, is, is a really basic thing, I suppose. Um, 
it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an obvious, it's a sort of truism that people on the on the fringes are always on the lookout for avoiding censorship or avoiding and evading detection of various types. This is why I'm always staggered when people say, "Oh, I can't believe that Islamic State are so good at using the internet," and I'm like, "What are you talking about?" I mean. Mostly, they're men aged between 18 and 24. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not really weird for them to use hashtags. You know, that's pretty, pretty much in line with what everyone else of their age is doing. But also, radical groups tend to have a greater incentive to be looking for ways to avoid censorship because they're always feeling like they're being censored. So it's true of the radical right. One of the first bulletin board systems was Stormfront. You know, the English Defence League, which was founded in 2009, which I followed, have followed for a very long time indeed, was essentially a Facebook group with a very small militant wing that used to go and do street protests. They're always on the lookout for these things. And so you can never be surprised that radical movements of all stripes are always trying to figure out what the latest technology is and trying to use it. That has always been true and will always be true. But here's the problem when you start trying to censor how they use those or ban them from using them or whatever. The first thing is every time you try to put a ban on any of this sort of stuff or any type of censorship, immediately there is a now a counter reaction of people building it again. And you saw it in the early 90s with the crypto wars um, where essentially the US government's efforts to clamp down on military grade encryption led to a great explosion in the availability of relatively easy to use powerful encryption for everybody. Massive backfire. And the same thing happened after Edward Snowden. Loads of people suddenly motivated to build encryption tools and censorship evasion tools for people to use. And that's frustrating because the knot keeps tightening and I think it will continue to tighten. But the lesson is that you can try and stop these things from getting out there, but every time you do, more and more of them are going to pop up. And that's really bad, because I want to just tell you something about it's like a second story from, the, from, the, from my book, Radicals. But basically, with this book, I just spent two years with all these different radical groups and movements, free love communes, psychedelics communities, the radical right, militant environmentalists, trying to get a feel for all the different types of radical ideas that are out there at the moment. And I spent an awful lot of time with the English Defence League. Well, actually, it wasn't the English Defence League. It was, it was Tommy Robinson. Do you guys know who Tommy Robinson is? He's a sort of leader of the English Defence League, He's going around for doing these anti-Islam demonstrations for, for months and months and months. Now, in 2015, he gets in touch with me and says, the problem with the English Defence League, Jamie, my dear friend, is that we, we were always too drunk, we were always too rude, we were chanting and we were fighting, and it turned people away from our movement. And he said, I want to create a sort of respectable version of the English Defence League, a sort of a, a movement that can appeal to the middle classes. And, um, and over, over uh, six, six months, I followed him all across Europe as he tried to build this thing, he called it Pegida UK, a respectable version of the English Defence League. Um, and he, actually, he succeeded, right? I mean, that he, he put on demonstrations where there was no drinking, no fighting, no violence, no swearing, and obviously no people because <laughs> they were the reasons that people were going to join the English Defence League in the first place. But I followed him everywhere he went. And one of the things about him, like, like, just like all the other groups I've talked about, is that he's like, he's like this, like the rest of us. He's constantly on this thing all the time. Constantly sharing, sharing, sharing. And he has obviously a huge network of online followers. And one of the things that he does is every single day he uh, receives, usually through Twitter, sometimes through Facebook, news stories um, that corroborate the worldview of the English Defence League, which is essentially is that Islam and the West are at war, politicians are too afraid to admit it. If you try and call it out, you'll get called a racist. And it's left to people like him to defend Western civilization from this encroaching threat. And every single day, he gets, I reckon, 20 or 30 stories, direct message to him on Twitter, that corroborate this view of the world. Here's the tricky thing about it, right? 
it, the, the stories that he gets are not always wrong. They're not always from conspiracy theory websites. They're not always from Infowars. They're not always made up. They're not always from Breitbart. They're often from very respectable outlets. And they are about things that are actually happening. The problem is, you're cherry picking all the bad things and then sharing them on your social feeds to create the impression of a very, very obvious sort of overwhelming problem. But that's what he does. And then the danger is, and this happened to me many times when I was with the English Defence League and Tommy Robinson, you say, Tommy, do you think that maybe you're being slightly, slightly unfair on Muslims and maybe you're kind of tarring them all with the same brush? And he's like, what are you, what are you talking about? Are you, have you seen all what's going on? Have you seen it? These are things that are happening, Jamie. You're part of that liberal establishment that's trying to silence us. And this makes it extremely difficult to counter because they are based on actual events. And the danger is, and I saw it so many times with him and his followers, every single time they get silenced or heckler's veto means Tommy Robinson can't speak or he, gets, he has been treated pretty badly by the police over the love. No one really wants to say this. No one really wants to defend him. But I think he has been treated really badly by the police who have repeatedly arrested him and then let him go intentionally to disrupt his activity. All it does is feeds into the narrative that he has that there is a grand conspiracy against people like him who are trying to raise awareness about what's going on. And that is, in some senses, an even more powerful message, an even more powerful drive than the ideology that we're fighting Islam. It's even greater to think the state is trying to shut down on you and that you're rising up against it. That holds that group together. It is absolutely central to groups like the English Defence League, the idea that you're being silenced, which is why every time you do try to censor them, all it does... Firstly, they'll get that information out somewhere else. Plus, they now have an added bit of a sort of evidence about their ideology and philosophy that they're being silenced. And a sense of injustice is such a powerful part of the motivation for any radical group. So this is why I think it's... This is the reason why censorship really does backfire with radical groups. But the other reason, and this is the final point I'll make, and then maybe we've got time for a few questions. Jim, let me know. Have, have we got time for... Yeah? All right, good. The other reason is I actually think that in the next 10 years or so, censorship is going to get really, really difficult. I mean, actually, almost impossible. I think we are entering into a phase whereby, whether it's through the dark net or through the continued proliferation of encryption and sort of default encryption, or whether it's decentralized networks based on blockchains, that we are entering into a phase in which censorship is actually going to be more or less impossible. I mean, with my work on the dark net, for example, sad to say that it's, it, it is more or less impossible to remove illegal material from the dark net. And... I mean, if you go onto any of the online drugs markets, the sort of the barriers to entry to accessing illegal material or ransomware being sold in huge volume or counterfeit money or whatever is getting lower and lower. That trend is going to continue. So censorship is going to get far more difficult, which means that we are, we are really at risk here of constantly trying to censor people more because of the reasons I've set out already and the government's tendency to do that at a time when it's going to get impossible anyway and it only adds fuel to the flames and this is the thing that really worries me and this is I think unfortunately the almost tragic direction in which we are going and I'm to be frank I'm not particularly optimistic that there's any way out of this but the way that I see it is to begin to get ready for a world in which censorship doesn't really exist it's a very, very different world indeed to the one in which we live. And in the end, what it requires is people to take more responsibility for their own actions. I mean, people, yes, we, I, I know the, it's the laziest thing in the world to say, well, we need more education. And if at every time I heard we need more education, I mean, literally, kids would be at school 24 hours a day. If every, 
because every single social policy area, in the end, people say, oh, we need more education. But I think one thing that could help, firstly, is at the moment, digital literacy, media literacy, critical thinking skills in schools, yes, we teach it. I don't think we give it anywhere near enough importance. And we, we often tend to teach it in relation to counter-terrorism or extremism. That's a terrible thing to do. It's a core skill for everybody. And the other thing, uh, and this is my final point, you can only develop as an individual to reject ideas or think for yourself about difficult ideas that you will come into contact with in a world in which censorship doesn't exist by coming into contact with those ideas. I mean, we have to, I think, be far more relaxed. I know it sounds a bit strange, but far more relaxed about seeing these things online that we don't like, because it's only through doing that that we build up our own critical faculties to know how to deal with it. And I'll stop. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Jim, do we have time for questions? Is there time for a couple of questions? Um, so I'm wondering... The damage that one person can do is growing exponentially, and at the same time, um, we seem to be giving more space to people to talk um, more and more um, radically. How do we how do we go about making sure that we don't end up in a situation where we all die? <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm actually really, really pessimistic at the moment. And it's not, I'm genuinely really, really worried. Because I think, you're exactly, I think you're exactly right. I think it's getting far more easier for a smaller number of people to do more damage. And all the different trends that I see bubbling up and sort of working with each other, I think we're in for some really, really difficult times ahead. I mean, actually, in the end, I think governments are going to need to have more power. Uh, and I know maybe this won't be popular in this, in this room. But I think in the end, governments will need to have more power to do more things, and we are going to have to have far more oversight in restricting how they use that power. Um, you, sorry, you, you talked about um, censorship no longer existing. Um, we, I mean, we've got a situation where, for instance, the counter-terrorism in, internet referral unit um, uh, the police has taken down 270,000 pieces of extremist content over the last, since 2010, I think. Yeah. So, are you suggesting that that you know, over the next few years won't happen anymore, or are you suggesting that it will simply be ineffective and that this sort of material will be driven underground? Yes, so, so yeah, so huge amounts of volume getting removed, but um, if you think back to 20 years ago, the idea that there could be 270,000 pieces of terrorist content on the internet would have staggered everybody, and they would have said, oh my God, that is the end of censorship if we can see that much stuff online. I think that there's going to be just as much being taken down by governments, but even more that keeps popping up and remaining. And this is a thing that kind of worries me because what we'll then do is we'll just keep spending more and more money trying to remove stuff that... It doesn't need to go onto the dark net at all. I mean, loads of stuff's on things like Pastebin and, I mean, things that aren't on encrypted networks at all. So I, I, don't, I think that there's going to be more material, more efforts to remove it, tighter sentencing and stuff on the people that put it up, and yet it will still be there in even greater volume. You suggested that children and, and digital rights uh, awareness and digital literacy is one of the keys to use, you think, to improving this balance. In a world in the UK in which every kid's internet use is monitored 24-7 through schools, um, through safeguarding guidance that came in last year, yeah. how do we balance that with a government that wants to monitor everything a child does online, at home and in school? And what can campaigners and activists do to uh, balance that uh, narrative? Well, that's really for you to work that one out. I mean, to, to, <laughs> like ki ki any police officer that works with young kids or has young kids always knows that they get around these things so easily. I mean, it's embarrassing. Um, 
And the other thing is that they go into schools and they learn about stuff, and then the minute they walk out the school gate, they're doing all sorts of other things, which is what I would have done when I was 15 as well. I mean, this is the thing that worries me sometimes when I talk about Tor. I'm like, Jesus, I mean, someone would have told me about these, like, uncensorable drugs markets when I was 15. It's literally the first place I would have gone. <laughs> so, like, the, the reality is that all the... All the the warm words that we'll say about teaching young kids to be careful and decent and thoughtful, they are, they're, they're just, they are still going to make loads of mistakes and they are going to go and do all of this bad stuff. That is just, I mean, and we will, ne we'll, we will never get around that problem. If we think that we can ever make the internet a much nicer place to be, then we've got to really start with ourselves. Like, we've got to make people nicer. And frankly, that's been a 100,000 year long human project that hasn't completely succeeded yet. So. <laughs> So, I don't, so, so I, don't have, I don't have an answer for you, I'm afraid. And I've been told I've got to wrap up on that miserable note. So thank you very much indeed.